broadcasting from the Annie Up studio. It's the longest running poker podcast for the everyday poker player with your host, Joe Scales. Hello, A-Team. It's Friday, May 19th, and you can see me. <laughs> it's our first video podcast. I'm excited to release this one. If you're listening to this wherever you listen to your podcasts normally, don't worry, it's not going away. We're going to continue to put this content out on the various audio platforms as well. But now, if you want, you can see us do your favorite segments. This week, I have a sneak peek of the Where Are They Now series that will be in the magazine starting with the June issue. I talked to Tom McAvoy, the 1983 WSOP main event champ. He's actually won four bracelets, but he's probably best known for that main event run. I shared a little bit of our conversation in the Table Talk segment of this show, but you'll just have to wait until the magazine comes out for more of that. As I've said each time I put out something new for Annie Up, this is the first video podcast and my goal is to get better with it each week. I know I certainly learned a lot with this one, but let me know your thoughts at podcast at AnnieUpMagazine.com. That's all I have, so let's get on with the show. Find out what conversations are happening around the poker table with Table Talk. This week's Table Talk is a little sneak peek into the June issue of Annie Up Magazine. I've been working on a Where Are They Now of Poker for months, and the upcoming issue will kick things off with Tom McAvoy. Tom McAvoy has four World Series of Poker bracelets, was inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame in 2013, and let me tell you, we talked for well over an hour and a half, and I've pulled some of the highlights out of that, most notably some of his stories about Doyle. If you want to see Tom... He'll be at the Casino Collectibles Association show at South Point Casino on June 16th from 2 to 4. Go say hi. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Do you still play a lot? Uh, yes, I, I play. Not every day. Um, I'm certainly wasn't as active as, uh, as Doyle has been. <laughs> I call myself semi-retired because I don't go out on the poker circuit anymore like I used to. I used to travel maybe five months out of the year. Yeah, going to different venues of poker tournaments. Now, I always spent the, the whole month of August at the Bicycle Club in L.A. playing their Diamond Jim Brady tournament and all the stuff else before that even. So I've been uh, very active for a number of years on the circuit, not so much anymore. But I am playing the World Series of Poker. I will play several events there, including the main event this year. Oh. And... We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite ready for the rocket chair yet. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Uh, I think George Jones had. I don't need your rocking chair. That's what it was. <laughs> you can take that rocket chair and put it where the sun don't shine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> <That's what laughs> yeah, I know we're going to talk about Doyle at some point. Yeah, we, let's let's just jump in right there. Let's just jump in right there. So obviously, you know the the. News of him passing sent uh, shockwaves through the poker community. The number of hands that I have seen where people were posting their 10 deuce that they played and, and whatnot. So tell me your experiences with Doyle. I've got my own personal stories. And in fact, I'm working on one final book. I haven't written a book in quite a few years now. But I'm doing one last book, and it's not a strategy how-to book. It's my autobiography, and I have stories about Doyle, and I'll tell you what I think is my absolute favorite Doyle Brunson story, and I'm sure nobody's heard this. And this is, I swear to God, everything I tell you is okay. gospel. It's true. It's December 1st, 1978. I'm in Las Vegas. I still live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, my hometown. I had not moved to Las Vegas. I eventually moved to Las Vegas in July of 1979. So this is uh, about six, seven months prior to my official move. I've been in Las Vegas ever since. 
So I bought some of them as part of my move. I, I was still trying to debate whether I wanted to attempt a poker career. And everybody, friends, family, everybody <laughs> thought I was out of my mind, crazy. You know, I played such a crazy uh, thing. I considered uh, playing poker professionally in Vegas, one step removed from being <coughs> a member of the mob, I think. <laughs> 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 bad it was. So anyways, Doyle Brunson <coughs> had just come out with his new book called How I Won a Million Dollars Playing Poker. Right. <coughs> Eventually, of course, they changed the name to Super Sisters. Exactly, yeah. This book had just come out, and I've been playing in some of the uh, on a Las Vegas trip, testing the poker waters, and people were, of course, talking a lot about this new book. I said, well, I was mainly at that point a seven-card stud player, but I knew I was going to learn to hold them and try to master it. So I said, well, i got to get this book. All right. So, at the time, Doyle had his own publishing company. I, b- I believe it was called B&G Publishing. It was on Industrial Road in Las Vegas, which is parallel to the Strip, but off the Strip a mile or so. So, anyways, I get the address. I said, all right, I'm going to go there. I'm going to buy this book. And it was 100 bucks. This is 1978. 100 bucks is quite a bit yeah. for a book yeah. of any kind. So, I decided... Uh, I've got to have this book. If I'm going to try to be a professional poker player, I, I, I need to get this book. So I look up the address of the publishing company, and you know, I have a rental car or something. Anyways, I, I go down. I find it on Industrial Road. I walk into the office, and nobody's there except one mm-hmm. person, the man, <laughs> the man himself, Doyle, sitting there behind the desk, <clears throat> nobody else around. So I go up to him. Yeah, I know, I, of course, I recognize him instantly, even though I hadn't seen him before. Right. Um, and I kind of introduce myself and say, I'd like to buy your book. And he says, sure. And, and, he, and he autographs it. And he says the same autograph. I think a lot of times he says, may all your deals be good ones. <laughs> all right. So I give him the 100 bucks, get the book, and then I do something else. Uh, I'm not known to be too over the top most of the time, but, but I went like this. I, I'm not like two inches from his face. I'm back about three feet. I said, I put it my face. I said, I said, one of these days, I'm going to be at the same table with you. You just wait and see. He starts laughing, and you know, like I'm sure he said that kind of a challenge before. Right. It was not said in a mean way or a threatening way. I'm sure. Just that I wanted to play. I want, like a lot of guys, would love to have one crack at, you know, Doyle once, you know, play him at least once. Lots of stories. But I said, what are these days? I said, I'll be at the same table with you. You wait and see. All right. So so he laughs, signs the book, you know, and uh, we, we part ways. And then, this is 78. In 1983, I'm playing Doyle during the main event. Uh, the last two days of the tournament, I, I was facing him on day three as well as day four. And uh, I wasn't the guy that busted him. Rod Pete was. Rod Pete was the guy that came in second to me. Doyle finished third. That that was 1983. That was the last year Doyle made the final table of the main event. A lot of people don't know that. Because he won a lot of other tournaments after that, sure. including World Series bracelets. You know, yeah, but that was his last serious run. You know, at the main event. Of course, everybody thought he'd win, but, you know, life and poker aren't always fair. <laughs> so uh, he didn't. Rod Pete busted, and then I beat Rod Pete, and, and that's the story. My second favorite story <laughs> of Doyle that I got, I planned him in the main event in 1983 on day three. I had made up my mind. I was, a, I was, even though I'd been a Las Vegas pro for like four years, I was a relative unknown. Of course, this is my first time in the big leagues, you know, the main, the main event. Earlier, I had already won my first bracelet. I won the limit home tournament about a week or less prior to the main event. And then I won a satellite to get into the main event. Otherwise, I wouldn't have played. I wouldn't have just ponied up to 10,000, even though I'd won a prior event. So, with my satellite, I get into the main event, 
I'm facing the Doyle on day three, and I had made up my mind no player, no matter who it was, was going to intimidate me. I, you know, if I went down, I went down. It was chip, but I'm going to play my best, and I'm not going to be searching around or intimidating anybody, and that including Mr. Brenson, Emerald Slim, and all the other big names. So I'm at the same table with Doyle, and I came over the top of him quite a few times since day three. Also, my good friend T.J. Cloutier said, Tom, you're ten times the player now than you were back then. But back then, I had no fear or maybe no sense at times because if I even thought someone was bluffing, especially Doyle, I'd come over the top of him time and again, and I got away with it. You know, now I'm not so sure. <laughs> right. So right. It worked. Because, you know, I was like, who's who's this guy? You know, back then. You know, now it's a different story, of course. Right. Um, as far as uh, name recognition and so forth. Anyways. Were you? I mean, I had a happy ending. <laughs> well, not so much. <laughs> but a third is still pretty impressive. You know, Doyle has had back-to-back wins. He was second to Stu Unger. He was third the year I won, and I think he was fourth another year. Not just tournaments. He was a great cash game player. It, it, it wasn't just tournaments. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. In fact, I don't even think he considered himself that much of a tournament player. Right. You know, most of his uh, money was derived from cash games. Absolutely. Now, of, course, of course he did well in tournaments, too, but, uh, but he, his forte was cash games, not tournaments. Well, and that's kind of the way it was back then. And from it was it, exactly, tournaments were just were considered a kind of a, an anomaly. Yeah, other than the World Series of Poker for a number of years, there, there was not much else going on. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to that little snippet of my conversation with Tom McAvoy. I had so much fun talking with him about poker and some of the changes through the years. I hated that there was that glitch in the video, but I definitely wanted to make sure you guys got the rest of that conversation. For more of our talk, be sure to check out the June issue of Annie Up Magazine. Thanks, guys. Now it's time for Call the Floor with Elliot Schechter. Elliot Schechter is the poker room manager for Rivers Casino in Schenectady, New York. He joins us each week to say how he would rule on situations that come up in your games, and he's with me again this week. Hello, Joe. How you doing? Doing pretty well. Things are good up in New York. How you doing? <laughs> good, good. We, before we came on here, we were just talking about allergies, though. it's It's been pretty rough everywhere. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, everybody gets to see you on camera now. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Put a face to the voice. Uh, I rearranged my office now so that uh, we can actually get good lighting in here. Um, but uh, we'll see how, you know, it's small steps. We're taking small steps here. <laughs> but good steps. Nice to be yeah. out of the shadows. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We've got an interesting call the floor this week. It was sent in by Daniel Welsh. And so let's get into that. Uh, He says, at a poker room in Tampa, Florida, I get into a Thursday evening tournament. Late registration is until the first break at level six. They're 20 minute levels. We come back from break and go through a whole level and a half. And in the middle of level eight, someone sits down, gives the dealer his buy-in receipt to get chips. The dealer calls the floor over. And they let him enter because he technically bought in before late reg was over, even though it had been over a level and a half since late reg closed. He then proceeded to go keep going all in and beats my big pocket pair with junk. I told the guy running the tournament he shouldn't have been allowed to play or at least get blinded off, but they told me they had to let him in because he had paid for his entry. So basically, I guess I could buy in and wait until the bubble, then sit down and get my chips. Was the floor correct in letting him sit down and get his full amount of chips, or was I right in thinking this was wrong? (laughs) There's quite a bit to unpack here. Yep. (laughs) And I get the feeling we're missing a couple facts. Daniel, you don't tell us whether 
when he sat down, uh, the villain was taking the only available seat? Or did he, as you alluded to, just stroll in and, and wait as long as possible before he sat down, regardless of how many seats were open? Okay. In late reg, uh, especially in smaller rooms, and I'm assuming this wasn't one of the larger rooms in the Tampa area, or the large room, I am guessing that there were probably several seats open and this guy was just playing the various table games or betting whatever races were being simulcast that afternoon <laughs> or evening. Yeah. In which case, yeah, he should have been already in play regardless of whether he showed up with his ticket and gotten a full stack. There are a lot of cases in smaller rooms, though, where you'll have all of a sudden a, a big rush of people re-enter, uh, overfilling the tournament at that point. Well, in that particular case, even if it goes a, a level or two past uh, registration, they did register on time. They fulfilled their obligations. Seating was limited, whether by staffing or tables or both. And yeah, some people will get in a couple late levels. And let's face it, if you're if you're max late regging, as it's called, if you're registering at the very last possible moment, you're not playing slow. You're getting it in with whatever you got to try to spin up. So absolutely, yeah. Don't be angry about the results. You weren't going to be angry if he if he tried to spin up and lost to you. So again, he was getting in with junk no matter what. The result was bad for you. I agree. Don't be angry about that. Uh, if in fact there were seats and his chips were already supposed to be in play, be angry about that. That's something you should take up with the casino. Now that we're allowing late registration into all these events, daily, weekly, monthly, major, it takes a lot of work, which means the people running these events, my colleagues, my my brothers and sisters in this entry, have to pay attention to what's happening. Right. And if he entered and there were multiple seats open and he just decided to stroll up, this is completely unfair, like you said, regardless of what happened in that hand. You can't play the results. You got to you gotta follow the process correctly. If there were multiple seats open and this guy just strolled up and, and decided to play then, yeah, I mean, he could have effectively been sitting down to the bubble, which is incredibly unfair to everybody and certainly violates the spirit uh, of, the, of the rules in play, maybe even the actual rules in play. So when, when you say multiple seats open, are you saying like a, a waiting list? For people, if somebody busts out, then they bring in people in like that? What? Yes. Okay. There's generally an alternate list kept. Yeah. And by the time you get to a few minutes into the uh, the level after registration closes, you're pretty much exhausting that list. You should have one or more seats open at that point. And if you don't, I mean, that's fine. I mean, things happen. I mean, some, sure. some tournaments don't bust as soon as they should. <laughs> Right. But this is one of those times when you know you've got late reg and, and you've got people registered. You've got to pay attention to see what's happening. If there's seats open and, and you're already well past registration time, you got to get those chips in play. Right. They had their chance to unregister from the tournament. That time has passed. You can't be seating people with full stacks at their leisure. It's not how this works. Right. So, yeah, like, like you said, if he's out playing the horses, that's different than if he was listed as an alternate. He didn't do anything wrong if he bought his ticket and was an alternate. That's different. Precisely. If yeah. he was being seated in turn as an alternate and they were keeping up with everything that's going on, then, yeah, that's fine. Within reason. I mean, at right. some point, it's just not reasonable to – let's set an example. you got an eight-table room and you've got eight tables for the tournament and – Lo and behold, you, you've got 60 people waiting. <laughs> if you're three levels past the registration closing, at some point you're just going to have to refund all these alternates. You just can't keep feeding it in. Although, at least in that case, you're probably still not down to the money. Right. But there will come a time where you, you could have, uh, and this is theoretical, right? you could have enough registrants that... Obviously, with the new 12 and a half and, and, and 15 and even higher uh, percentage payout structures now paying more of the field, you could pass the point that enough late registration and alternates will grow the number of people in the money 
therefore making the bubble quicker to get to, making it theoretically possible that some alternates may be able to effectively be sat at the bubble. <laughs> That's true, yeah. I mean, it would have to be a pretty extreme case. <laughs> but you certainly shouldn't set up a tournament for that to happen. When even you were talking about the Rivers Revival, you know, even with that different kind of a structure, you did the math to make sure that something like that doesn't happen. Uh, and Precisely. so if the poker room didn't do the math to see how that works, then that's on them as well. But if it's within reason, then there's nobody that did anything wrong. Just judging from the theme of what, and granted, this is coming from someone who had this happen to them. So it might be a little one-sided, but judging from the conversation that he had with the, the poker room manager there that he said that he had to let him in because he had paid his entry. So it doesn't sound like it was a, an alternate situation, but it could definitely have been. Yeah. I'm still 50, 50 on that. I, we, that's a key fact that we're not seeing right now. Right. And again, when players follow the rules, the house has to follow the rules too. Yeah. The TDA has the elastic clause in the opening of the rules, and sometimes that has to be enforced. At some point, you have to determine, especially if it's too small a field in your event, that people who don't get seated at the end of registration can't get in. Right. Sometimes you have to make that determination. I mean, Daniel's right. It's just not fair for somebody to enter at the last moment and be sat at the bubble. And, and that shouldn't happen. And I'm going to assume that didn't happen here but it was probably fairly close. Yeah. But yeah, that, that just shouldn't happen. That really defeats the purpose of, of, of all the other people showing up on time and playing the levels and taking their chances and, and getting eliminated. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, Daniel, I'd love for you to send me a, a follow-up email. Just let me know for sure, you know, give us some clarification on that. Was this uh, an alternate situation or was he out uh, playing the horses as Elliot said? And uh, so, yeah, just let, let us know on that. And if you or anyone else has a call the floor that they'd like Elliot to break down, then uh, send it to podcast at anyupmagazine.com. Elliot, it's good to see you. Literally. You too, Joe. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. You too. Talk to you later. Bye. Let's break it down with Hand of the Week. All right, we are back with another Hand of the Week with Patrick. How you doing, Patrick? I'm doing well. Doing well. <laughs> so I didn't get any huge feedback. Nobody said that you just completely I know. I was hand. I was waiting for the, the kickback. I'm <laughs> like, all right. So we've been listening to this guy now for weeks now, and this is how he plays a hand. But you know what? I take it, guys. You know, we've I guess we've all been there. Live and learn. Yeah, absolutely. It was you really didn't do really awful. Um, there, there were some moments in there that, you, you know, probably could have been better, but you, you didn't destroy it. Very true. I mean, I think there were times that it was live and learn. I think the, the one that hammered home and I may or may not still be thinking about, to be very honest with you, <laughs> is when Mike said, don't do it. Yeah. And then immediately the, um, I'm going to be the bigger man. I did it. <laughs> and let me tell you, we're still talking about it three weeks later. <laughs> Such is life, though, you know, and, and that's fine. So, Mike, you're listening. I can't wait to play you again. See you soon, bud. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this week, our hand of the week this week, I, I touched on it last week, but Todd Lemansky sent this in to us, our ambassador for LA. Nice. He had a deep run in the, uh, the Mixed Game Championship, and he's been hearing me complain that I want more than just hold them hands. So he sent me a whole bunch of them. But we're going to go over one this week. It's uh, Omaha 8. Okay. So, levels are an hour long with a slow structure. The field is tough. It's full of circuit grinders, bracelet winners, and multiple players with $3 million plus in lifetime tournament caches. So, you got your work cut out. I was going to say tough table to be at. <laughs> glad, I'm glad I was taught and not with any of us. <laughs> All right. So, he says... Recently, I won a nice pot in the seven-card stud round to put him right around the chip average for the first time all day. Before that, he had been nursing a short stack and cultivating a tight image. 
The opponent in this hand is Jason Brawl, a circuit grinder and current chip leader of the tournament. He has made a lot of super deep runs and is a solid player. Jason makes it two bets from under the gun. Oh. This guy, Jason, is comes across as the typical young player. He's sharp and aggressive. He's been very active all day. And conversely, we've folded a lot of buttons. So it folds to us on the button. And we have the Ace of Hearts, Seven of Hearts, Jack of Spades, Ten of Clubs. All right, so what are you going to do with that? So with that, uh, you know, I've got a couple more players coming afterwards. He's been pushing it, um, and as Todd said, he's aggressive. Um, right, and and Todd's got the uh, kind of tight image as well. Right, so, so I've got two options. One, I can push it a little bit more, or I'm just, knowing me, I'm going to call and just play with it from there. Right. <laughs> that, I mean that's just that's just what I do. No, I think but I think that might be the right right place in this one. Yeah, and you know, Todd says Todd makes his little note here. It says in most circumstances this hand is a fold, which I agree. In a lot of circumstances it is. Yeah. Uh, it has a terrible low, right, which yeah. Uh without any backup, but it can make several nut hands if the low doesn't come. And as he says, I do have to defend the button sometimes. This seems like a decent hand to do it with now that I have some extra chips. And it should be easy to get away from if I don't hit the flop. Very that's, true. That's Todd's thought. So I actually, I, I just want to touch on that point as well because he said in most circumstances this is a fold. But I think most of the time, in my case anyway, most of the time if I'm playing it on the button... It, I, I'm calling most of the time. But I'm going to call really wide on the button in most cases. So in in Omaha 8 especially, I, I, I'm pushing the action more on the button than in most other games. That's just my style of play, I think. But probably in any other position, I would agree I, it, it would be a fold. a fold. So you call, Todd calls, the flop is the Jack of Diamonds, Ten of Spades, Three of Clubs. So it's a rainbow flop, and Jason bets. I mean, with that, I mean, I've I've paired up top two pair. I'm going to push the action a little bit. You're going to raise him? I am going to raise him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So in your case, you're going to raise. Tell me why. So my thought process, so Jack of Diamonds comes out. What did you, it's ten, ten of Spades. Yeah. Three clubs. So it would still be tough, correct me if I'm wrong, as a novice with Omai, it's going to be real tough unless the next two come out to a low hand is probably not going to come out, correct? Right. So in this case, I now have top two pair. If I get another third one of one of those, then all of a sudden I've got my boats and I'm looking very good. So that's my thought process. Okay. I mean, I get what you're saying. <laughs> now let's say now let's figure out if I'm wrong or right on this. Um, <laughs> in games like Omaha, Omaha High Low, okay. those you're making a lot more money checking and calling than you are gotcha. pushing the action because there's so many turn cards that can just completely crush your dreams. Come to bite you in the ass. Okay, <laughs> all right. I'm I'm following the thought process a little bit. Todd says I have a tight image. So I don't want to convey too much strength just yet in case he's bluffing. The rainbow board means I don't have to worry about a flush draw and it needs to come runner runner low cards for a split pot, which is what you were talking about. Fair. Come. So he calls. The turn is the king of clubs, which makes the board the jack of diamonds, ten of spades, three of clubs, King of Clubs, and you've got the Ace of Hearts, Seven of Hearts, Jack of Spades, Ten of Clubs. And Jason checked, so what are you going to do? Well, going back to how I was playing the hand when I did push it last time, to get away from that image, I mean, you could, you know, just, I mean, I would just one bet here, probably, but I mean, 
Knowing knowing him, I would guess he ended up checking. What did he say? Yeah. Todd says, my first thought, I hope he didn't just make a better two pair or turn a set. He did raise pre-flop. Perhaps I was seeing monsters under the bed and should have bet to charge the flush draws. But I also wanted to save that bet for the river so I can call a bet when the flush comes and I don't improve. Not to mention, Ace Queen just made Broadway. Oof. He That's checks. a good point. Wow, he, I didn't even think about that one. Good. <laughs> checks behind. Probably a smart move. <laughs> Probably a very smart move. Yeah, again, I come back to that point that I was talking about earlier where you're in these kind of games, you're making more money by checking and calling in these spots. Yeah. Obviously, if you've got the nuts, push the action. But... Uh, in these kind of situations, then check call with a board like that. Okay. So the river comes out, the jack of clubs, and Jason checks again, meaning the board is the jack of diamonds, ten of spades, three of clubs, king of clubs, king of clubs jack of clubs. So you've made your boat. Yep, sure have. Um, you hope that he made uh, a flush right, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, you're hoping that he's um, got the clubs there. But, uh, you hope that he doesn't have something like pocket kings. That's a good um, point. So so he checked. What are you going to do with that? Yeah, I mean, you said it there. I mean, you're hoping that the flush, he hit the flush, and he's checking to see what you got. You definitely have the boat. I mean, at this point, it's looking like the only thing – that could beat again is the pocket kings, which would be interesting because he did bet after the flop and then check after the king came out. I, I'm definitely going to push the action. I don't know to what extent. You know, that that will keep... If he's got the flush, he probably goes away, correct? But if he's got something else, you know, then, you know, maybe not. Right. That's what uh, what Todd does as well. He bets and he gets check raised by Jason. So he's got the kings. So what are you going to do with that? Well, it's one of two things. One, he said Jason was the aggressive player, the young guy. He's been pushing it. Maybe he's trying to push you off of this and second guess whether he's got the kings. Um, Because at this point, that's looking like the only thing that can beat you. I mean... After just winning a pot, I probably go away. Thinking he's got the kings. Okay, you're not going to go broke. Um, it is. I mean, you win big bet games. You hate to put in money when you don't have to, but you do have a full house. True. Granted, it's not the nut full house, but the only hand that's beating you right now is pocket kings. That's true. So you, I don't know that you can fold out hands. You might be. Having a little bit of uh, <laughs> nightmares, as as Todd said, monsters under the bed after after your hand some, last week. Some Mike but... <laughs> monsters, some Mike monsters taking me down. This one just in the form of Jason, who I haven't even met. Yeah, that's fair. That's very fair. What? Well, let me ask you this. So, when you, I mean, you've already bet at that case because Todd did say you bet, correct? Mm-hmm. Then he gets checked, raised. Do you come back over the top? Do you call? Absolutely. No. Okay. No, I don't I don't come over the top because you're not getting anything else to call you. If he was bluffing and you come over the top, he's gonna fold. Yeah. If you're if he's got the kings, then he's gonna call you. But anything else, you're just throwing money away. True. You know, you're just putting money out there and, and if he's got you beat, he's gonna call and win. If he doesn't have you beat, he's folding. So what's what are you getting? What are you gaining from it? Fair enough. That makes sense. What did Todd end up doing with the check race to him? So Todd says, I have the dreaded Omaha under full <laughs> <laughs> on which a ton of money is won or lost in this game. Perhaps I was still seeing monsters under the bed, but I figured I'd only get called by a better hand if I three bet, which is what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the only hand I'm losing to is Kingsfull, which will raise me again 
putting me to a decision to fold for one more bet or risk losing two additional bets with a second best hand. Gotcha. Um, so I call and Jason shows ace three, three X. So he flopped a set and rivered the boat, but Todd scoops a nice pot. Very nice. So he says things to consider. Did I lose value on this hand or was I playing good Omaha by not overplaying a non nut hand, which I think we kind of touched on. I was saying, you know, you're, you're making your money check calling right. in this. There's no need to go crazy. I don't, I think, I, I don't think you lost value there. You were behind on the flop. Yeah. So I don't think you, I don't think you lost value. And should I have folded this hand pre-flop? Any other position other than the button, I say yes. Any other position other than the button, I throw it away. But again, my style when I'm playing 08 is I, for better or for worse, I play way more of a wide range from the button. Yeah. So. I, I would have played the, the hand in that spot as well. Plus, Todd didn't Todd say that he he had folded a lot of buttons leading up to this, anyways. Yeah. So, right time, right place to play this one. You know, clearly. So. Yeah. Well done. Well, thank you, Todd, for sending in that hand as well as some others. We'll we'll hit on those others at a later date as well. I don't want to get lost in the uh, uh, non holdem hands, but uh, we will mix those in if. Anyone else has some hands that Patrick and I should break down? Send them to podcast at com. Patrick? Sounds good. I'll leave you with um, good luck to your Royals because they're yes. on a winning streak and they're still <laughs> terrible. So on that note. They're on a winning streak and they've won like 12 games. So that's how bad they are. But uh, <laughs> Until next week, we'll see how <laughs> yeah. we do. All right. <laughs> see you guys. question is how you running this week i'm joined by frank ramsey uh, i reached out to frank to be on the show because i want to talk to him about the player of the year race that he is battling in right now uh, over at uh, play poker chicago so frank how you doing no joe thanks for having me Good deal. Yeah, absolutely. I already kind of know the answer to the, my first question to some degree, because like I said, you're you're currently the leader in the player of the year race, but I'm going to ask anyway, okay. how you run it? How you running? <laughs> I'm running pretty good. I got to say, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I enjoy poker and I love playing tournaments and you know, it's just been, it's just been fun. I I can't complain. Yeah. So you're primarily a tournament player? Pretty much. I mean, I play cash, but I but I would rather play tournaments, you know. I I just you have to have patience in tournaments as people know and cuz I like to put up 100, 200 dollars and sit there for hours and you know, <laughs> focus on winning the prize, so they say, is right. not, right. you know, losing $200 in 10 minutes, but I would do it, but I prefer tournaments, yes. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit First, about uh, Play Poker Chicago. Sure. Uh, so explain to the listeners what Play Poker Chicago is and maybe how it's different than going to like a regular casino. Well, I could tell you, um, I've started joining them in June and I've noticed right off the bat that you'll never find better tournament structures that they have. They have um, extremely good dealers and they're really nice dealers. You feel wanted. It's like a family environment. And we have the same followers week in okay. and week out. And, you know, they're all over Facebook and Instagram. There's a poker site that they're, they're on. I mean, I cannot tell you, you will never find another charity event that gives everyone at the table, a drink ticket, buys them lunch a lot of times I mean, Kevin does everything for these players to make them happy. And that's what it's really all about. I mean, you want to keep your players coming. You do what your best you can. And sure. I, I just think, you know, we're relatively new and we compete against a bunch of other charities every weekend, but we're holding our own, you know, and my job is to get the charities into the room and, 
you know, like VFW, uh, Lockport, the men's and women's auxiliary I have. I have McHenry American Legion this Saturday. I have the Joliet American Legion. I have the Joliet Moose Lodge. I have Joliet VFW. Um, I had the Plainfield Moose Lodge and the list goes on and on there. Right. I'm working with cancer people, rehabilitation people, you know, I'm, I'm school districts. I'm working with a lot. Okay. So you're more than just a player. You're going out there and you're bringing these charities in. And, yeah. And- yeah, I am. I, my, my job, my job is to get the charities and the locations to host the charities if they don't have a location already. That's okay. what I do for them. And I enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I'm always wanting to support charities and, and help raise money for those. So I'm glad that uh, places and, and there's, there's a, you know, there's a number of them in Chicago that are doing the same kinds of things. And, yeah. and I just, I love that that is a thing there. So. Well, part of my, part of my thing with this is Joe is I've built a relationship with all these people like, and they're, they're going to keep coming back because they trust me. They I've got all their personal numbers and stuff like that. And they always call me. I handle all the questions and I go to all the meetings and, you know, I, I do everything I can to help support this, this wonderful organization that we have that I, I truly think is going to grow and be really, really good, much better than what it is now. Getting better every day. That's what, uh, that's oh, yeah. kind of the philosophy. I mean, yeah. You know, we we got to work together as a unit and, and keep performing. And that's what I do now. And then I focus on doing that and building it and building it until the best of my abilities. Yes. Yeah. Well, the same can be said for your poker play. It seems, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> trying to, trying to get better and, and, you know, yes. making it to that, that end deal. So tell me a little bit about this player of the year at play poker Chicago and how that works. Well, so at the beginning of the year, when he started the charities, uh, what our first one in October, I believe he decided to come up with a player of the year. And what the player of the year is, I believe it's the top 50. They, they go for a special tournament at the end of the year. But to get to that, every week when you play tournaments, you accumulate points if you make the final table. Then, okay. of course, the more tournaments you win, the higher points you get, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a beautiful trophy along the way. Oh, I saw it. I, I saw I it. Want it. it. I, is, I want it bad. It is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, is beautiful. And I and I really do want it. I, I, I have a lot of sentimental value and and – you know, everything I do, I want to win. Obviously, most people want to win. Right. But considering the way I've been going, I, I just I, I just hope and, and knock on wood, I can keep doing it because that's basically how it works. And then there'll be some special tournament. I don't know exactly what it is yet. Kevin, Kevin would know that. But, you know, it's it, there's a lot. I mean, there's it goes to December. So December 31st is our last tournament for the player of the year, or if that's going to be the final tournament of the year for it, I believe as well. So, so you get points, you get points throughout the year and the top, you said 50. I think it was 50. Whatever it yeah, is, the I top, believe that, whatever, yeah. you will play in a final tournament. Yeah, I believe that's how it works. It it, it might be 100, but I think it's 50, I I, I believe. And then you get something for winning. So I, I just want to keep <laughs> winning, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, it's a grind. We'll see how it goes. Sure, yeah. yeah. Hopefully that'll it'll keep going that way, you know. Well, if you continue, I, I assume that you will. But, you know, it's a long, long race. So I think I, think I saw you've yeah, won yeah. over, yes. you've won five, and then you can chop. So it's uh, like five and something, five and a quarter or something like that wins that you have i've actually i've actually won like six and a half okay it's not updated yet oh yeah so it's even been better so you're doing yeah. even better and i'm i am, <laughs> I am. <laughs> and i it's you know like i said i i used to be a really good bowler so everything i do i do to win like everyone should do but Poker is just, you know, you got to be lucky too. You know what I mean? Sure. Let's face it. I mean, there's skill, but you got to be lucky. And to win something like this from wire to wire would be 
<laughs> a big cap in anybody's. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? It, it's just, it's not easy, but it's, it's a, it means a lot to me. It really does. And I hope I can continue doing it. Well, I'm you super know? glad that, that uh, I was able to talk to you today, talk about uh, this series, the player of the year series. But uh, if you would keep us up to date as things go on, you've got my email and, and my phone number. Just keep me up to date. See how things are going. I can always jump on the website and check things out, but, uh, but j just shoot me a text sometimes yeah. and let me know how it's going. And when we get to the end, I want to circle back with the winner. So it may be you. I hope it is. <laughs> so I hope it is. I, I really do. I, I appreciate the time and, reaching out for us. We really need a lot of support and, you know, it means a lot with Annie up and you backing us up in our corner. It, it means a lot. Trust good me. Good deal. Well, listen, good luck at the tables and uh, we'll talk soon. You got it. Thanks All again, right. Joe. Let's take a time out to talk strategy in the coach's corner. Mark Bremen has been a poker coach for over 15 years. He's been a strategy columnist for Annie Yep for years as well. Now he joins me each week to talk a little strategy. Mark, how are things down there in Arizona? Good morning, Arizona. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. Yeah. <laughs> We're in uh, like mid-May now. So how hot is it out, out there at this point? You know, uh, Tucson, while it's, Further south than Phoenix is actually, you know, between six and ten degrees cooler than Phoenix because we're uh, our elevation is different. Um, I've always got my eye on the weather. I don't even need to look at my phone because uh, I'm always walking my blue heelers yeah. out in the desert. And today will be uh, somewhere between eighty and ninety three, with uh, I think uh, we have some rain coming. See, I could take that weather all the time maybe even a little hotter but uh my wife disagrees well wait a minute now you know the heat index isn't nearly as bad as it gets over where you are in the summer because it's dry heat it makes you know it's that's not just an invention <laughs> that's it's you know our 88 90 is pretty comfortable yeah that's fair and it's when it gets 106 or something like that even the dogs kind of pull back a little like are you kidding dad you know <laughs> but, uh, i go 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 so uh you know if you want to hang with the pack you gotta stick with me <laughs> there you go <laughs> for this week's strategy you know last week we talked about speculative hands uh you kind of touched <laughs> on pairs so i wanted to go a little more in depth on oh. that this week but pairs in general is a pretty broad topic you know you've got um, what small pairs, medium pairs, you've got premiums Good. and then everybody's favorite somewhere in there is pocket jacks. Right. That's exactly how I break them up. Did you read that for me or what? I did? I did. Okay. I cheated okay. <laughs> from one of my prior columns, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this week let's focus on the small pairs. And then we'll go into depth, more depth with the, the others in the future. That's a great idea. So I'm going to give you the floor now. Let's start with small pairs. Okay. To give them a little context, last week was about playing speculative hands. And there's a lot of similarities between pairs and speculative hands because we're sort of going into the pot right. um, with an idea that we want to hit our set. So let's, like you said, let's start off with the small pairs, which deserve their own category because you do not, I, I emphasize, do not want to play your small pairs the same way as the other ones. So let's, let's define small pairs first. Yeah, I go, I'm with deuces through sixes. I've read deuces through fives. I've read deuces through sevens. It depends who you talk to, but let's for, for this for this conversation, let's talk about deuces through sixes. Is that cool? Yeah, that works. I I'm in the I'm in the deuces through sevens category, but sixes will fit fairly well. <laughs> okay, and we have cash, and we have tournament, and it gives great context to this conversation. Um, the first thing I want to say is, in tournaments, a major 
big tournament, which is a slow moving tournament with hours of, with rounds sure. that last more than an hour. We just at the in the early stage of the tournament, we want to eliminate small pairs completely because our stacks are over 200 big blinds. Right. And we don't want to do what happened to me in the um, monster stack. It was like the third hand and we were all bantering and we're getting to know each other. Where are you from this, you know, and we were waiting for the table to fill up. Cards are in the air and um, I hit a set of fives and it was set over set. And uh, yeah, we got the whole thing going. You know, the guy played it great. He played his set of tens, which was top pair. He led right into it. He had raised preflop. I put him on aces or kings and I re-raised him and I didn't know anything about the guy. So, um, I thought, wow, I got a fish on the hook because he re-raised me and I re-raised <laughs> him and we turned over our cards and that was it. That was like um, the best five minutes I ever, I ever had. <laughs> that's, that's an expensive five minutes right there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that was a 1500 buy. Uh, yeah. It left me like, you know, the old feeling with the baseball bat over the head thonk, you know, <laughs> uh, like I, why am I playing? Why am I doing something that I've written not to do? And I had a game plan on my index cards of not playing small pairs in the early rounds, but it was shorthanded and I just got carried away with it. So I have the experience of losing in a big tournament set over set. So if we eliminate small pairs in the early stage of the tournament, when our, when our, when our chip stacks are, you know, really big, um, the odds of us getting knocked out of a tournament with set over set become really small and great players. That's, a, that's a typical way a, a really strong player loses in, in major events set over set. You just can't get away from it. It's really, it's really hard. Right now. Conversely, <laughs> you, you would have flopped the set had you have played and you threw it away and you'll curse the day you met me or listened to me. <laughs> Because in your mind, you know, that was the biggest pot you ever would have had and it would have got you, it would have propelled you to the final table or wherever you are in the tournament. You know, there is a time that you, we can gamble a little more with with our small pairs later on in the tournaments when we're not, you know, you know, 200 big blinds plus deep. And that changes the equation. And a lot of poker does come down to the math, even though I'm not a wonky player. I'm, a, you know, I, I'm kind of a feel player. I don't really go by math, but the math has to make sense. Sure. What you're saying is that the the stack size should determine how you play or when you play pocket small pocket pairs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in relation to the blinds. And I, I spoke about tournaments. Let's move over to cash. Okay. Um, it's a lot easier if you're playing in a 1-2 or a 2-5 game to go bust. You know, if you had a set of threes and somebody hits a set of nines and, and, and you just rebuy. You know, it's not the end of the world. So imagine you lost somewhere between 200 and 800 bucks because you hit a set over set. You can rebuy. You know, right. It's, it's, it's much easier to live with. It's not, it, you know, it, it's such a big factor. However, when a person raises in front of you and you have a pair and you want to set mine and it is a smaller pair, you must look at their stack and you must get 15 to 1 as far as how much money you're putting in. Therefore, if the guy's raised it to 20, we need to see 10 times 20 is 200. We need to see $300 in front of them in a cash game, which would be a 15 to one. Now, hold on. Give me a second. Coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You saw me. I was coming. I was, readers, 15 I to one see, is you know, high. Let me try to put it for you this way. Why 15 to one when we all know as poker players, and by the way, pre-2000, nobody knew this at the table, that hitting a set is eight to one. And now everybody knows that, which is 12%. Now, a little more, you know, it's eight, right. eight, whatever to one. But you can, you know, let's just call it eight to one. So you're going to hit a set one in eight times. We lose with sets often enough to that's why we're looking for a big potential opportunity to cash in when we do hit our set. 
And that's like, Yahoo, we did it. Right. You know, we felt that that guy was gay. <laughs> you know, if the guy raises to $25 and you look, he's got 120 bucks in front of him. So we're in a 1-3 game. And, you know, we have, you know, we have him covered. He's got one hundred twenty-five dollars in front of him. It doesn't. It doesn't pay to, to 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 roll the dice. And a lot of newer players think the opposite. They think, oh, he doesn't have a lot. I'll play. But it's the you. You should have the opposite thinking. You should be thinking, ooh, I can stack that big stack and get my three hundred dollars. Okay, but let's let's look at it from a different standpoint because I understand what you're saying um, with stack sizes. But if I'm playing for, to hit a set, right, uh, I have pocket fours and I'm just looking for a four or I'm out and I hit my four, can I really be that afraid of someone else having a set when I know that they only have a 12% chance of hitting that as well? Or is it just a matter of in order for it to be the long run profitability, then, you know, I'm I'm not going to win enough for it to be worth it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Imagine you were building an equity chart, and you just imagine that you had pocket fours ten times, and um, we hit the set once, and we will only be able to write in plus ninety, and then all the times that we missed for ten dollars, then for the time that they didn't hold up because somebody hit their flush, it's a negative. It, it's a negative equity occurrence unless we're getting paid. And, you know, when we build our equity charts, we would be using, I don't know, a hundred hands or a thousand hands. And sometimes we have to factor in the number of players also right. in the hand, just like with speculative hands. But the most important player when you're making your decision with your small pair is the person who raised. You gauge his stack. But, Let's just reemphasize that they need to be played um, with a different strategy approach with a cash game and a tournament game. So in a tournament game with a big payout structure at the end, if you're right. in the early, early stage of the tournament, it's just not a good place to be. Now, there's the other side of the coin, and you get paid off, but that's – you know, once the blinds go up, well, you just may got paid off by half. And then when the blinds go up again, you got paid off by half. It's not really going to make that big of a difference. Now, later on in the tournament, let's imagine that we're struggling or we're below the chip average. It might be time to take a shot to hit a set because um, it would make a big difference. And like Doyle Brunson wrote, and we got to mention Doyle because uh, I, I heard he passed away yesterday. It's my, my inbox is just filled with former students and students, you know, uh, yeah. sending me his bio. He like he said he liked to play him fast, and that's who I learned from. I learned poker from Super Sifo. Uh, he had a tremendous impact on my life, and um, he right. likes to lead with the sets because that's how you build a big pot. One of the themes throughout that book is uh, aggression. Right. So, for right. sure. Um, I have taken some quizzes on GTO whereby I bet my set fast and GTO said, ah, like I got it wrong. <laughs> and there is a difference the way you approach a set if you're heads up or if there's multi way. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. With heads up, you can afford to. Um, be a little coy, you know, be a little, uh, you, you can wrap the table. It's an option. It's an option, but it right. depends on the flop texture. One last thought, Joe. Yeah. The odds of having set over set are X. It's not a, a common thing, but it's enough to crush you. Let's just call it a thousand to one off the top of my head. I, I should have that for you. But if you eliminate deuces through sixes, the odds of having a set over a set are astronomical. Sure. I see what you're saying. That makes that makes a ton of sense. If you're going to play and you get set over set, if you're not playing the smaller pairs, then the chances are that you're the, the higher end of that set, <laughs> at yeah. least. All right. Mark, I appreciate you. You have uh, a good day out in that dry heat. 
and uh, we'll talk again next week. Time to walk the dogs. Take care. There you go. <laughs> it's time for Joe's One Outer. Let's talk about image. You have to understand the concept of table image, yours and your opponent's. Then learn how to exploit it. How you view others at the table is most common. At its most accurate, it is your impression of them based on your observations of the way they play. You can even reduce it down to one word. Tight? Weak? Aggressive? Passive? Are they chronic bluffers? Straightforward? Tricky? You decide, but don't be afraid to update that information as the game goes on. It does you no good to make observations about your opponents if you don't use that information. Form an opinion about your opponent and use it to figure out what their betting action means. Use the information to narrow down their range of hands. You also have to consider the image that you have at the table. Understanding your image in the mind of your opponent requires that you see yourself through their eyes. This can be hard for some. There are a lot of players that get caught up in how they'd like to look. But generally speaking, your image at the table will depend on your recent history of action. Forget how you think of yourself. Think about how a player, knowing nothing about you, would view your play based on what they've seen lately. Once you understand that their impression doesn't do you justice or that Anyone who is really familiar with your play would just know that these past 15 hands were not representative of your true poker style. Then you can start to take advantage of that image. If your opponents think that you're a maniac, they're much more likely to disrespect your bets and raises. So you should be more aggressive than normal with very strong hands because your opponents are going to fold less. On the other hand, bluffing probably doesn't make much sense with an image like that. If players see you as someone that folds too much under pressure, then you should take that opportunity to chase a little bit more, and you certainly should be bluffing more with an image like that. Most importantly, remember that your table image is not static. Use it, change it, then use it again. It's the players who can change styles on the fly that can win consistently no matter what kind of table they're at or cards they're getting. It seems counterintuitive, but think about yourself at the tables as much as you're thinking about your opponents. It may just give you the advantage you need. That's today's One Outer, and that's today's show. I'll see you next week, A-Team. And until then, I'll see you at the tables. The Any Up Podcast is a production of AnyUpMagazine.com. Contact the show at podcast at AnyUpMagazine.com or call the show at 540-339-7741. If you'd like to advertise, send an email to editor at AnyUpMagazine.com. <laughs>